Hello, everybody. Um, สวัสดีท่านแขกผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่านนะครับ uh, Thank you for the opportunity that I have been given today to be here. Um, I'd like to share with you my passion about digital technology and education. It's a passion that is driven by the belief that because of the new technologies that we have today and the new understandings that we have about learning, mm. something big will happen in school. Some big changes will happen soon. All right, and it's really driven uh, by the facts that we now know a lot about how humans learn today. Now, I believe that all of you have been through the school system, so it might be a little bit difficult about, you know, how much you know things can really change in a classroom. So, allow me to um, set the scene by showing a few examples of past changes that has happened throughout history. I think um, we all know this one pretty well. Um, we used to believe that the world is at the center of the universe, and it's not really hard to imagine why. We didn't really have the tools to observe what was really going on, so we saw that the moon was moving, stars are moving, but we're not. So you know, we're must, we must be at the center. And it was Galileo who were among the first people who came up and say, "Hey, I've designed these new tools, and from my observation, I think it's the sun we're orbiting." And that's the basis of the common understanding about the universe that we have today. But did you know that it took almost, or a bit more than a century, for this discovery to become widely accepted by the public? And Galileo was actually um, prosecuted for suggesting such radical ideas, and he had to spend the rest of his life in uh, house arrest. So I think that shares a lot with uh, what might happen in schools today. Um, A little lighter example. Um, we used to believe that margarine is a lot healthier than butter. This is a story from my grandmother. You know, so everyone in the mid 20th century were switching from butter to margarine. You know, they, because they think they can keep their eating habits without having heart disease. But with more understanding about the early margarines, we discovered that margarine actually has the most amount of trans fat, the most dangerous thing you can eat to have heart disease. So you know that was wrong. But that. You know, led to uh, policy changes about about margarine, and we develop better margarines that we have today. But we don't really think about margarine being better than butter anymore, except that it's a little cheaper. Another example: um, Did you know that we used to spray DDT directly onto children? <laughs> DDT is very popular in during World War II, and uh, the public was told that it's safe. You can inhale, you can eat DDT without causing any harm. So many schools in the U.S. actually use DDT to eliminate hair lice, and you can search the term DDT spraying on YouTube, and you'll find many shocking, you know, videos of what we used to do. So our better understanding about the harm of DDT actually led to, you know, a different perspective on DDT. And when we look back at what we used to do, you know, sometimes that's very uh, intriguing. So let's get back to schools. All right. So I believe. We will be able to say similar things about what we do in schools today. You know the way we educate our children, because new understanding in cognitive science, in brain science, and in development psychology has led to the understanding that people don't learn too well by pure instruction or by rote learning. But yet, that's what happens. That is what's happening in most schools today, right? The what, the where, the when, the how of learning today. It's very different with the technology that we have, you know, with Wikipedia, um, you know, with the cell phone, with you know, like the iPhone, iPads. But yet, school hasn't really changed the way they teach things um, since they begun um, with the general public about a century ago. So that's really something that I think will make soon we will realize that schools aren't really creating the kinds of skills that we need for the 21st century. Okay, so that's that's the inspiration, right? Um, that's what keeps me going. It's a little bit radical. It's a little bit out there for some people, um, but it's why I do what I do. Okay, so what I'd like to share next is you know what I'm doing about it, right? And it's such a big topic that I, as a as an individual, I won't dare to say that I'm going to change education. You know, I'm going to be the one who makes the difference. I'm going to be Galileo, but the important thing is you know I can't help. To be fascinated by this topic, so I'm going to share with you today what I'm contributing um, to to uh, education. 
The thing that I find most fascinating when studying this is that a lot of what we learn in schools today are determined by what we can do with paper and pencil, the technology that we had a century ago. Now that we have technology, things can be so different, but we don't really think about it. Sometimes we teach things just because you know, we've done that with previous generations. So, for example, do we really need to get kids to memorize all these facts about history now that all the information is available just a few clicks away? Or do we still have to teach algebra in the most boring ways now that we have the tools to make them come alive and you can see why we learn all of this? Right? And I'd like to start um, by using an analogy that I've learned from you know, one of my mentors. Um, can you add these two numbers? What's the result? 30, right? How about this version? Same, right? But I believe that for most of you, you know, this slide was almost like a, you know, a clue for the previous slide. Because it's not just because you're more familiar with Arabic numbers, but there's something about Arabic numbers that makes addition or arithmetic easier than Roman numerals. And before the Arabic numbers became popular in the Roman Empire, doing additions and things like this were only things for the elites because it took many years for them to perfect this skill. It's not something that anyone can just go ahead and learn and do. But when the shift came um, to Arabic numbers, now you know, primary school children can do the same task. So this is the kind of shift in the medium that results in fundamental change in what we can learn, that I believe, and many of us believe, that will happen with the digital technology. So let me show you a few examples of that. Um, so this is an example of uh, a work that I did introducing children to um, balancing a robot. Um, and, you know, we balance things very well. You know, we can keep a stick on our fingers and, you know, prevent it from falling. Um, but if you look at the science behind that, it's very complicated. And there are many useful ideas that you can use and apply to different um, things that you do in life, like sports or economy or things like that. So I developed an environment on the computer that allows children to um, get to the ideas that are behind. Now, I don't have enough time to explain to you how I did it, but I have a story to tell about what happened when the father came. You know, so the father of one student came one day. He was a very well-trained engineer. And when he saw what we were trying to do, you know, we were trying to get the robot to balance a ball on a beam, he sat down and said, son, if you want to understand what's going on, you need to understand the following. And he spent the next 20 minutes writing down the equations, you know, and arrows and all of these things. And the best thing that happened, though, was that the child said, dad, you're not making any sense. We were doing just fine on the computer. We, we can already see what you're trying to say on the computer. So to me, that was the pinnacle, you know, because it means that the computer if designed well, can communicate to children ideas that used to be hidden behind all these maze of you know, equations and things like that. So that was a success, and it's the kind of thing that I think reveals the true power of technology. So I know I realize that there's a lot of you know, risk with technology, but I think if you design it and use it well, there's a huge um, opportunity. So I'm trying to go, I'm trying to live a life following Galileo and not make what I do become the margarine or the DDT, all right? Okay, so we've later learned that the technique that we were using you know, in this piece of work actually was the same thing that they used to control um, the shuttle in the early 80s, right? So they had, you know, this is from NASA, and this is what we were doing with 30-year-old um, um, children. So it just highlights what you can do with technology that, um, the kinds of things that you can learn with technology that used to be too hard. Um, to grasp. Since then, I've developed many other technologies that tries to do the same thing. So I've developed the GoGo board, which is a robotics toolkit that allows children to um, create and implement some of their innovative ideas. And you know, sometimes it's to make a better world. And you know, so for example, this is an intelligent stick for the blind. It has a sensor at the end. So the idea is that when you walk around the, uh, the sidewalk, you have different different colors painted on the sidewalk, and it tells the blind person where you are, um, if you're reaching a bus stop or if there's a dangerous intersection ahead. 
So it's an opportunity for kids to express their innovations. This is a model of a um, intelligent room that only turns on the light when somebody's inside, things like that. And we've done many things with robotics. Roboblox, this is a programming system for very young children, so early primary school children. You know, they, don't, they can't really uh, write yet, they can't really type very well yet, but we want to see if they can get to the ideas behind programming. So we quickly uh, found that um, kids can put together these command blocks that we have and use them to control a moving robot. And you'd never get it right the first time, right? So it's a fabulous opportunity to get very young children to think about problem solving, sequencing, debugging, and things like that. Okay, we've also developed an online uh, magazine system. This is just to show that I'm not just a robotics guy. Um, and it's developed from um, our observation that children love to go on field trips and take pictures. So we've taken that opportunity and transformed it into a learning activity where children will have assignments when they go on a field trip, they have to tell a story. Take pictures, come back, write a story on the system, and then um, the editorial process is actually the part where they learn key concepts about journalism and communication. So all of those things share the same um, goal, is to get kids to do things that were previously difficult and to, have le to make learning more active and fun. Now, that was my passion. Next is my responsibility, right? So I've tried to implement these ideas in schools for more than 10 years. And the, things that I've, the thing that I've found is that although schools sometimes accept my ideas and let me work with kids, I'm not usually part of the main thing that happens in school. You know, I'm just this thing that happens in an after-school program or maybe an extracurricular activity. If I cause trouble, they get rid of me. And I like to call this um, phenomenon the appendix phenomenon, right? It's sort of the same thing. Um, so I've discovered that it's really important to think about other factors that are important when you want an innovation to work in schools. And I've learned a lot about it when I was working on this um, project. It's, uh, some of you may, might have heard of it. It's called One Laptop Per Child. We were trying um, to... Uh, give children um, their own laptops. So we will have a whole class, everyone has a laptop, and you know, see what happens, what are the opportunities, and what are the risks. So we did a relatively small um, you know, pilot study with 500 machines. Most of the schools um, were in Chiang Mai, you know, near where I am, so I get to see a lot about what happens. And the thing that I've learned from this experience is that there are three basic building blocks that you need to have to get something to truly work in a school. Right? So the materials, the tools, that's just one part. You need that. That's the innovation. But it's sometimes deceiving, because when you put a technology into a school, um, in the beginning, they, used to, they, they are usually very excited and enthusiastic about this new toy they have. Like you put a laptop in front of a child, it goes like that, and they bring the laptop to school every day. They're excited to learn everything about it. But then this excitement, this energy level falls quickly after some weeks or some months. And you know, I, I like to call this behavior the Perks curve, because I think it's a natural thing that happens, and every one should understand this when, when you work with schools, is that it's natural for the interest, the energy level to fall. There's a great risk, if you don't do anything about it, that your project will fail. The whole thing will fail, because it will just you know, go away. Only if the school can think about how to use the technology in a meaningful way, to integrate it into what you're really doing in schools, can the energy level come back up. And if you can manage that to happen, it usually stabilizes after a while. It might not reach the height of you know, when you first introduced it, but it, it is a great chance, there is a great chance that it will sustain. Two other things that are important. The institution factor. Right? So you know, the CEO has to be on board. Right? The headmaster, you know, if, if he or she doesn't agree on what you're doing, then that's mostly the end of story. So we have a great example about how one school, you know, one headmaster, believed in what we were doing with the laptop, and she, and she actually organized so that we had nine weeks to do projects, to learn with the laptops, without any traditional class. And that's something that you don't typically 
see any schoolmaster would you know, want to do. Right? It re- requires um, courage to do and the belief that you know, what you're doing is right. The last part is the uh, sociocultural factor. That's the teacher and the, and the parents, especially the parents. And the parents are very worried about what happens with their children. So you know, getting them involved, um, providing a, an open mind about you know, how learning can take place is very important. It's tricky, but if you can make that work, it usually results in learning activities that are really quite unique. For example, we've seen um, projects with household accounting. Now, this is a picture of, a, of an account book um, which the parent has to log her income and expenses, which is required for her to get financial aid for the local co-op for her debt problem. So the way it works is that the child got the laptop and uses the laptop to help the parent with the logging. And, and instead of using a regular logbook, he uses you know, Google spreadsheets. And it becomes something that is real for the child because you can't screw this up. You, know, you might not you know, get financial aid if you screw up. And the teacher uses it to um, teach that student about spelling, you know, about how to do mathematical analysis through statistic, statistics and you know, things that used to be quite hard to do before. So that's an example of what um, you can really get. This is another project you know, that you know, they integrated the laptop with a local Thai band so they would have like a, a drum, a tie drum, and a few other instruments, and the child would um, play the laptop. The laptop would be one um, um, component of the band. This is quite popular, actually. So those three components are the key to make things happen in real schools, from my experience. Right? So um, making that happen is really an art form. There's no real science behind it, so it depends on the situation and how you manage it. I'd like to summarize um, by showing you this map. It's a map that shows how much um, instruction a child at age 11 receives around the world. Um, Not every country is in the data, but you can see that Thailand, my beloved Thailand, is number one in this category with almost eight hours of instruction per day. And it shows that the education system realizes that there's a problem, but the natural response is to do more of what they're already doing. Right? So you instruct more, you are more rigorous about testing. So it shows, it's, I think it's normal for a struggling system to re- respond this way. But it also shows that innovation doesn't happen automatically. Right? There's a great risk of all of this opportunity will be missed. So it's, a responsibly, it's a responsible for all of us to create the awareness to make it actually happen. And I'm very proud to be part of this process. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.